Well, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tom Banchoff. I'm Vice President for Global Engagement here at Georgetown and Director of our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. And I am delighted, I am really delighted to welcome all of you to the first of two days of activities we have set aside to celebrate the Center's 10th anniversary. This afternoon, we will have the remarkable opportunity to hear from former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright on the topic, Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, the challenges ahead. Thank you so much for being here, Secretary Albright. We can't imagine a better person to share reflections with us on this topic, on this occasion. Now, at the outset, just a few words about the center, how we got here, and where we're going. Under the leadership of President DeJoya, the idea for the center gradually took shape in the aftermath of the attacks of September 11th, 2001, at a time when religion burst onto the global agenda in a new and terrible way. At a time when the academy, long accustomed to the idea that the world was gradually growing more secular, still lacked the knowledge and the tools to grapple with religion's role as a force both for good and for ill, a force sometimes bound up with violence, but also a source of hope, reconciliation, and peace. Through the generous support of William R. Berkeley, who was with us this afternoon, the center was formed a decade ago with the twin goals of building knowledge and advancing deeper into religious understanding through research, teaching, and outreach activities like our gathering this afternoon, we've sought to address religion's complex role in the world and over the long term to advance the cause of peace in practice. Now here at Georgetown, we embrace this work as part of a global movement that cuts across, that engages universities, religious communities, civil society, and governments. A movement that will not abandon the arena to those who abuse religion for violent or destructive ends. This critical work thrives here at Georgetown where it corresponds to and embodies our mission and identity as a Catholic and Jesuit institution open to other religious traditions and engaged in the wider world. Our mission as a global university committed to the global common good. We are very grateful to all of you who have participated in our work over the years, we thank you for being part of our celebration today and tomorrow and for accompanying our work in the years to come. It is now my privilege to introduce President DeJoya, whose vision and support have enabled the creation and the flourishing of the center over the past decade. Dr. John J. DeJoya is the 48th president of Georgetown University, a role he has held since 2001. Over the past 15 years under his leadership, Georgetown has grown, prospered and come to exemplify and embody the model of a, of a dynamic institution committed to the highest standards of teaching, research, and service to the community here in Washington, D.C., across the United States, and around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming President Jack DeJoya. Thanks, Tom. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much, Tom, for those very kind words and for your extraordinary leadership as founding director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. We're deeply grateful to you for your countless contributions to Georgetown. The celebration brings together so many who have enabled the Berkeley Center over the course of this past decade to make significant contributions, not only to our Georgetown community, but to the study and practice of religion and world affairs. Through research, teaching, and service, the center has explored the intersection of religion with global challenges of democracy, development, diplomacy, and dialogue. Our conviction is that the deep examination of faith and values is critical to addressing these challenges and that the open engagement of different traditions can promote peace. Over the past decade, the Berkeley Center has examined a range of issues, from the changing face of religious pluralism in the United States to the role of religion within the United Nations system. This work has created opportunities for scholars and students to engage 
interdisciplinary perspectives on ethics and public life, addressing topics such as the nexus of religion and economic and social development in collaboration with the Luce Foundation and the World Faiths Development Dialogue, the significance and impact of religious freedom in collaboration with the Templeton Foundation, the dynamics of religious pluralism within and across societies culminating in a three-volume series published with Oxford University Press. Our community has also deepened our commitment to this work through a number of significant partnerships and collaborations, including with the World Economic Forum on reports on the state of dialogue with the Muslim world and on the faith and global agenda, a partnership with Building Bridges, an influential Muslim-Christian dialogue inaugurated by the Archbishop of Canterbury, which has generated a dozen scholarly volumes and a series of gatherings among theologians. A multi-year project on the Jesuits in globalization, capped by a conference in, at the Gregorian in Rome in 2014 to mark the bicentennial of the reestablishment of the Society of Jesus. Several dialogues with the Chinese State Administration of Religious Affairs to address different approaches to religion, society, and politics in both of our countries, and a collaboration with the Pontifical Council for Culture and the Archdiocese of Washington on a major conference on faith, culture, and the common good, the first Vatican Courtyard of the Gentiles event held in the United States. The work of the Berkeley Center is inextricably tied to the ethos that animates our community, the characteristic spirit that calls on each of us to live in service to others that asks us to take responsibility for the betterment of humankind. You can see this ethos come alive in our community with our identity as a Catholic and Jesuit institution and our commitment to genuine dialogue, to the exchange of ideas, especially with those different than our own, to the idea that we arrive closer to the truth when we presume the best in one another. It comes alive, too, in the work of the Berkeley Center in the scholarship of its faculty, the reflections of its students, and its efforts to bring together voices from around the globe in dialogue on religion and world affairs, and to bring us together here today in Gaston Hall. This extraordinary center, this celebration, has been made possible by the vision and generosity of William R. Berkeley, who has served for many years on our board of directors, whose foundational gift established the Berkeley Center. On behalf of our university, I wish to extend our deep gratitude to Bill and to Marge, whose service and leadership has had a lasting impact on our university. It is truly wonderful to have had their steadfast support of the center over the course of this decade. Words cannot fully express our gratitude to Bill and to Marge. Thank you. So today, as we gather to honor the Berkeley Center and its commitment to dialogue across religion and cultures between policy leaders, academics, and practitioners, there's perhaps no one better to offer today's address than the Honorable Madeleine Albright, who has served the global community and our community with extraordinary distinction. A recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Dr. Albright became the first woman to serve as United States Secretary of State in 1997, a position she held until 2001. Her exceptional career in government also includes positions in the National Security Council and as the United States Ambassador to the United Nations. She is known internationally for her visionary leadership on complex policy issues, and we have been honored to call her a member of our Georgetown faculty since she first joined us in 1982. Dr. Albright has also served as a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the president of the Center for National Policy. From 1982 to 1993, she was research professor of international affairs and director of the Women in Foreign Service program right here at Georgetown. We're deeply grateful that she returned to our university in 2001 
as the first Michael and Virginia Mortara endowed distinguished professor in the practice of diplomacy within our School of Foreign Service. Born in Prague, the Czech Republic, Secretary Albright has a bachelor's from Wellesley College, a master's and PhD from Columbia. She's the author of numerous articles and five best-selling books. One of these books, The Mighty and the Almighty, Reflections on America, God, and World Affairs, has a special resonance with the anniversary we celebrate today. Secretary Albright's book was published the same year the Berkeley Center was founded. And this afternoon, we have the honor of hearing from her about the complex role of religion in international relations as a source of conflict and as a resource for cooperation and reconciliation. So ladies and gentlemen, it's now my honor to welcome to the podium a distinguished member of our Georgetown family, a committed public servant, diplomat and scholar, the Honorable Madeleine Albright. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, President Joya, for your very kind words, for your great friendship, and for your tremendous leadership of this fantastic university. And I'm delighted to be a part of it. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here to mark the 10th anniversary of the Berkeley Center and to share my own perspectives on the challenges ahead for religion, peace, and world affairs. An easy topic, for sure. <clears throat> but let me begin by congratulating Tom Banchoff and Michael Kessler and the rest of the Berkeley Center faculty and staff for reaching this very important milestone. And I also would like to acknowledge the vision for set of William Berkeley, whose generosity, as Jack has said, uh, led to the founding of the center. Thank you so much for your inspiration for all of this. For the last decade, the Berkeley Center has helped drive a new kind of global discussion centered on the challenges of democracy and human rights, economic and social development, international diplomacy, and inter-religious understanding. As many of you know, the Center's work is based on two premises, that a deep examination of faith and values is critical to addressing these challenges, and that the open engagement of religious and cultural traditions with one another can promote peace. Those assumptions are as correct today as they were in 2006, and yet it's easy to observe current events in the Middle East and elsewhere and conclude that religion is anything but a force for peace. You could write an entire book based on this contradiction, and as President DeJoya said, I actually did. Uh, it was called The Mighty and the Almighty, and it came out at the same time that the center was founded. And my book explored God, America, morality, the Bush administration, Islam, and the world. As you can tell, there was absolutely nothing controversial in it, <laughs> though the title of chapter six was The Devil and Madeleine Albright. Uh, I can say it was not a book I ever expected to write, in large part because I was part of a generation that was taught to keep God and religion as separate as possible from foreign policy. I grew up with the Cold War when our enemy was a godless ideology, communism. In the 1950s and 1960s, much of our emphasis in the United States was on modernization, technology, and science. We were concerned with the space race, the arms race, computers, and color televisions. To a large extent, the same seemed to be true overseas. The Arab nationalist movement, for example, was led by secular figures such as Nasser, who associated religion with backwardness. The Shah of Iran had a similar attitude, and experts in foreign policy theorized about the rational behavior of nations, about realism, and about world affairs as a chess match between one powerful group of people and another. We were living, after all, in modern times. We associated, associated religious wars with the distant past, the Crusades, and the fight between Catholics and Protestants in the 17th century France. We saw places such as Northern Ireland and Kashmir as exceptions, lingering remnants of an earlier era, not as a sign of battle still to come. On the whole, 
we took a narrow view. And it's not that religion was forgotten so much as it was compartmentalized. It was personal, not public, and local, not global. We were not naive, but neither did we accord religion as much weight as it deserved in the foreign policy discussion. The fact is that world events are influenced by people acting out of faith, passion, and a sense of who they are and where they fit in. We saw this in Iran in the late 1970s, in Afghanistan in the 1980s, in the Balkans in the 1990s, and we see it today in many different regions of the world. So to understand why others act as they do and to persuade others to act as we would wish, policymakers in the United States and elsewhere need to better understand the religious dimensions of world affairs, and no institution is better positioned to assist in this endeavor than Georgetown University. Incorporating religion into foreign policy discussion has sometimes been hard for Americans to accept because we believe so deeply in the separation of church and state, and yet even in this country, we have never separated religion from public life. And in today's world, a president simply must take religion into account when they speak or act in world affairs. The question is how to do this without creating new problems. It's a challenge that a friend of mine has compared to brain surgery, necessary to do but disastrous if you slip up. A steady hand is needed, but so is a base of knowledge and expertise. And so when I was Secretary of State, I had an entire bureau of economists I could turn to and a cadre of experts on nonproliferation and arms control whose technical jargon earned them a nickname, the priesthood. But with the notable exception of Ambassador Bob Seipel, I didn't have a similar expertise available for integrating knowledge of religion into our efforts at diplomacy. And we had no Muslims serving in senior positions and just a few mid-level jobs. To address these problems, we did take some steps to increase our outreach and links to communities of faith, particularly in the Islamic world. We reviewed everything from personnel recruitment and training to the listing of Islamic holidays alongside Jewish and Christian ones on our official calendar. We began a series of discussions with representatives of American Muslims, inviting them during Ramadan to the first iftar dinners hosted by a Secretary of State. And we developed an introductory guide to Islam to be available to persons traveling on behalf of the United States to countries that had a Muslim majority. My goal was to signal to the State Department that having an awareness and understanding of a country's religious dynamics is just as important as knowing its language, culture, and history. I also felt it important to emphasize that while religious rivalries have often produced persecution and strife, religion has also shaped the world for the better. For example, religion has always been a globalizing force. Through the apostles, Christianity spread to Greece, Syria, and Rome, then into North Africa and throughout Europe, and ultimately to every corner of the map. Beginning in the seventh century, Islam also spread in every direction, bridging differences of language and culture, nationality and race. The borderless nature of religious faith often makes it easier for leaders to talk to one another, easier for nations to agree on common values, and easier for people from vastly different backgrounds to reach a consensus about moral standards. We know from our own modern experience that faith can serve as a source of inspiration and healing. Consider the eloquence of South Africa's Archbishop Tutu in ending apartheid, the legacy of El Salvador's martyred Archbishop Romero, the history-shaping ministry of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and the contributions of Pope John Paul II to the cause of freedom. More than three decades ago, I was in Poland during the early days of the Solidarity Movement, uprising against totalitarian rule. The Pope had just returned to his native land for the first time. Although choosing his words carefully, His Holiness dared to challenge the dogmas of the communist system. The enthusiasm of his audience astonished the Polish government, which had assumed that decades of dictatorship would have sapped spiritual devotion. Instead, the Pope's listeners drew strength from one another, 
suddenly realizing that the hunger for dignity and freedom each had nurtured was part of a mighty collective appetite. The result was a trickle that became a stream, that became a river, that became a tidal wave of courageous dissent, washing away the Berlin Wall, reuniting Europe, and transforming the face of the world. The truth is that atheism was communism's Achilles heel. Because democracy and religion have something very basic in common, and that is respect for the value and dignity of every human being. During the Cold War, this was the principle that spelled the difference between Soviet collectivism, which considered people just another means of production, and the freedom of expression honored in the West. Since September 11, 2001, this same principle has been at the heart of a new divide. Terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda and now ISIS, or as we call them, Daesh, see history as a twilight struggle between cultures in which the individual is a disposable pawn. They value not ideas but obedience, leaving no room for any vision but their own. Their declared purpose is to murder as many people as possible, as they have done in Lahore, Istanbul, Beirut, Brussels, Paris, and elsewhere. Their strategy is to convince their followers that killing is somehow noble and that primitivism is essential to defend one of the world's great civilizations. If decency is to prevail in the world, we must destroy the illusion that persists among too many people that terrorism can be justified. We must do more to rebut, marginalize, and defeat those who pour poison into the ears of young people, turning humans into robots and individuals into bombs. We must be relentless in making the case that terrorism is fully, fundamentally, and always wrong, just as genocide, apartheid, and slavery are wrong. There can be no excuses or exceptions. Daesh wants to provoke a clash of civilizations. Our goal must be to unite all civilizations against terror. And that means we need to remember that we were not attacked on September 11th by the Muslim world, we were attacked by followers of a perverse ideology that uses Islam to justify homicide, most often of other Muslims. Their crimes are not about religion, because Daesh is no more representative of Islam than the Ku Klux Klan is of Christianity. They have nothing to do with politics, because Daesh has no coherent political agenda. They are acts of murder, plain and simple. And in today's tinderbox of a world, we had better find a way to start putting old fires out instead of lighting new ones. During the Cold War, our greatest fear was that someone with his finger on the nuclear button would miscalculate and trigger what technocrats bloodlessly referred to as a nuclear exchange. Today, perhaps our worst nightmare is that sectarianism or religion will ignite fears and conflicts that, will be, uh, that we will be unable to contain. We know that the nature of these religious and sectarian conflicts extend back to ancient times, but what is new is the extent of damage that violence can inflict. A religious war fought with swords, chain mail, catapults, and battery rams is one thing. A war fought with high explosives against civilian targets and broadcast across the internet for the entire world to see is quite another. It is easy to blame religion, or more precisely, what some people do in the name of religion, for all these troubles, but that's too simple. We know what a world plagued by religious strife looks like, but we do not know what it would be like to live in a world where religious faith is absent. We have, however, had clues from Lenin, Stalin, Mao Zedong, and I would also argue the Nazis who conjured up a soulless Christianity that denied and defamed Jewish roots of their faith. Religion is a powerful force whose impact depends entirely on what it inspires people to do. The challenge for us is to harness the unifying potential of faith while containing its capacity to divide. Now, this is not easy to do, particularly in a political season where candidates are vilifying Muslims and exploiting the fear factor. The irony with all of this is that Desh that is the one that wants to divide the world along religious lines. 
we should not play into their game by provoking a clash of civilizations or leading Muslims to believe they are under attack by the West. But, what, but that is what happens when we suggest that our country should shut our borders to Muslims or patrol the streets of Muslim American neighborhoods. We need to remember that the first rule in public life is to frame the choice. We will win if people believe that the great divide in the world is between those who believe it is okay to murder innocent people and those who think it's wrong, between terrorists and those who are not terrorists. We will be in for a very long struggle if people believe the choice is between the supporters and defenders of Islam. This is precisely the fight that Daesh wants to have, but the truth is that when Muslims commit terrorist acts, they are not practicing their faith, they are betraying it. Not long after September 11th, I was on a panel with Elie Wiesel, and he asked us to name the unhappiest character in the Bible. Some said Job because of the trials he endured. Some said Moses because he was denied entry to the promised land. Some said the Virgin Mary because she witnessed the crucifixion of her son. Wiesel said he believed that the right answer uh, was God because of the pain he must surely feel in seeing us fight. Elie Wiesel said kill, to see us fight, kill and abuse each other in the Lord's name. And that's why I believe we have no greater task than to build bridges of understanding and tolerance before mutual ignorance and insecurity harden into an unbridgeable chasm of hate. There are some who might want to engage in such a bridge-building effort without bringing religion into the conversation, but to them I say, good luck. As Archbishop Tutu has pointed out, religion is like a knife. It may be used to slice bread or to stab your neighbor in the back, but it cannot be ignored. And that's why the efforts of the Berkeley Center are so important, because even though the State Department is undertaking an important initiative to better integrate an understanding of religion into the practice of diplomacy, there are limits to what governments can do and should do in this space. It is institutions such as the Berkeley Center that must play a, a leading role in confronting these challenges at the intersection of religion and world affairs. So I'd like to challenge this community over the next decade to do even more, to deepen our understanding of different religious traditions through research and education, to do more to encourage scholars to bring religious factors into different disciplines, do more to prepare students with the religious literacy that they will need in order to lead, do more to communicate this knowledge and understanding to a wider audience, to governments, the media, and the public in ways that raise the level of our political discourse and make for better policy, and do more to encourage new and deeper forms of dialogue among religious communities that can advance the cause of peace. In the end, both the Bible and the Quran include enough rhetorical ammunition to start a war and enough moral uplift to engender permanent peace. If institutions such as the Berkeley Center and Georgetown University help make sure that peace is the message we hear, accordingly, I will end with a quotation. If Muslims and Christians are not at peace, the world cannot be at peace. With the terrible weaponry of the modern world, with Christians and Muslims intertwined as never before, no side can unilaterally win a conflict. Thus, our common future is at stake. So let our differences not cause hatred and strife. Let us vie with each other only in righteousness and good works. This quotation is from a document entitled A Common Word Between Us and You, signed by a diverse group of more than 300 Muslim scholars. It is based on the shared commitment to monotheism and the love of neighbor that is central to the Quran, Hebrew Bible, and New Testament. I often wonder whether nations like people should be measured against these spiritual um, standards. And my answer is yes, because the principle that every human being counts is as valid in the secular world as in the spiritual. If we truly believe that, reflect upon it, and act upon it as a nation and in our own lives, we will have the basis for unity within our borders 
and with freedom-loving people around the world. We will take and hold the high ground against the apostles of hate who say murder is pleasing to God. We will steadily erode the legitimacy of dictators and tyrants who claim virtual divinity for themselves, and we will live up to our founding ideals, and we will take a small step forward in meeting the demands of religious faith while also promoting the noble cause of peace. Thank you all very much for your kind attention, and I now look forward to continuing our discussion. Thank you very much. That was a beautiful way to open our celebration of this 10th anniversary. I'm going to engage in conversation with Secretary Albright, and then in a few moments, we'll bring a microphone down into the middle of the aisle here. And if you have some questions, uh, we'll, we'll take some from the audience. So 10 years ago, you wrote a book, The Mighty and the Almighty. When, when did you know you needed to write that book? What was it that led you to come to that conclusion? Well, the thing that happened was, as I mentioned in my remarks, I was very concerned about how um, the State Department itself was kind of out of touch with what was going on in the world. As a result of um, some pressure from Congress, I did, in fact, have a religious advisor. Uh, and it was wonderful to have Bob Seipel around um, and to be able to uh, have somebody that taught me so much. And so one of the things that we really did do was to try to figure out, as I mentioned, how to explain Islam better to Americans. Um, I had a wonderful person working with me, Bill Woodward, um, who was my speechwriter, but also my great friend and mentor in all of this. And what happened was we did put together what I mentioned in my remarks, kind of a, a, a to-do list uh, for, or a, a, a be aware list uh, as people went into Muslim countries. And what we thought we were gonna do would be that it would be published in some way as a separate volume. Well, the next people came in and that didn't happen. And so I thought that it was really worth trying to pull that together along with a greater understanding of the role that religion played generally in foreign policy because there really was kind of the sense it's not our business, separation of church and state. And yet, even as I was in office, we saw what was happening in Northern Ireland or what was happening in the Balkans. And um, that, um, in fact, in the Balkans, it was an attack against the Muslim people. And so it was very germane, and I'm so glad I did it. And I have to say, um, I have enjoyed writing all my books, but I had to study in order to write this one because it was a real, uh, uh, it was new to me in so many ways. I do have a rather interesting religious background, but. Uh, Sh share your. Share your background. I'm not sure everybody knows. Okay. That. Well, my background was, as you mentioned, I was born in Prague, Czechoslovakia. I was raised a Catholic, married an Episcopalian, and found out that I was Jewish. So, uh, <laughs> I have a lot of internal discussion. So, <laughs> at what point in your life did you discover your your your, your Jewish? Well, background? I'll tell you what happened. I uh, had been I had been a professor, but not a. Uh, a figure whose uh, name appeared in newspapers. And when I became ambassador of the United Nations, I started getting letters from people um, in Czech and saying, I'm a relative, send money, or I need a visa. Uh, and in the various letters, there was often something, everything was wrong in terms of dates and the villages that my parents came from. And a couple of letters in the midst of all this would say, well, um, you know, you're Jewish, uh, which is why you make such terrible decisions. Um, uh, so I decided to ignore all that. So then what happened was just about the time that I was being vetted to be Secretary of State, I got a letter from somebody that had all the names and dates um, right. And so I was being vetted, and I was being uh, with the White House lawyers, and they asked all the normal questions about taxes and nannies and things. and then. They said, we ask this question of everybody. Uh, is there anything that you would like to tell us that we didn't ask you? And I said, well, I just got this letter, and it's perfectly possible that I'm of Jewish background. And they said, so what? The president is not anti-Semitic. Uh, so over the holidays, I talked to my daughters, 
my youngest daughter's married to a Jew, and we, they're very happy, the parents, the whole works. Um, and then what happened was that you're not allowed to talk to um, any press between the time that you're named and the time you're confirmed. But Michael Dobbs, a reporter, wanted to write a profile of me, and so my office gave him names of people in Europe and everything, and so he was writing, and two days after I was confirmed, he came to my office and started handing me these disgusting documents, which were um, cards that the Nazis had kept about whom they'd sent to concentration camps. Well, it turns out they had names of my family on. It's one thing to find out you're Jewish, it's another to find out how many of your relatives died. And so um, that is how I came to the whole story. Um, and last summer, I went to Terezin Stadt um, with my children and grandchildren and dedicated a plaque to the 26 members of my family that died in concentration camps. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in your opening remarks, you mentioned what it was like being formed in the field of international relations during the period in which, in which you were brought up, and the, the fact that religion really didn't have a place in, in your formation. Another member of our, our faculty over many years, Father Brian Hare, used to say, if you, if you look up religion, you look under R for religion in international relations textbooks, you won't Nothing. find it there. No. Um, as, as you think about the experience of writing the book in 2006 and how your own framework began to evolve, I, I wondered if you had gone back, say, to had, had written that book in, say, 1986, do you think it would have changed the way that you conducted yourself in public life? Um, I, I think um, it's an interesting way to put it. I think I would not have because I, what was really happening in many ways was um, the kinds of things where you become aware of religious differences. I, I love my uh, field of endeavor because I think history and political science are endlessly interesting and trying to figure out what people's identities are. The question, I think what would have been different is not, is understanding the importance of religion but not necessarily being so involved in the fights that were going on. Because what then was happening um, in the early 90s, well, it began um, um, in the Balkans in the early 90s, but, but the bottom line, that became so evidently a religious issue and minorities uh, and majorities fighting with each other. The only other time that this all became very germane, because I was in the Carter White House um, during the hostage crisis, and there really were issues in terms of trying to figure out where did all that come from, because as I mentioned in my remarks, the Shah had not uh, focused that much. Um, I think we did not pay enough attention to what the uh, Ayatollah was doing, um, and then all of a sudden, all this burst on the scene, we were trying to figure out at various times in the White House about how to talk to them and get some kind of a copy of the Quran. And basically, we're very, um, I think, primitive about it. But it did begin to create something that unfortunately is worse now than ever, is Islamophobia. And so there really, that began to be there. But in the, uh, when we were in office finally in the 90s, I think there really was an understanding especially in the Balkans, about what was happening between um, the Christians and the Muslims, and why was that happening, and how much of it was national, and how much of it was religious, because Yugoslavia had been uh, a lot of intermarriage, um, and that it had not been an issue. And what happened was that Milosevic used that kind of um, uh, really uh, terrible irredentism and nationalism to blame another religion and people for what was going on, and he made it worse by that. Yeah. Um, you made reference in your remarks to the clash of civilizations. And writing while you were in public office um, was Samuel Huntington and his, yeah. his important contribution to international relations discourse. How, how, do, how does that argument sort of uh, stand for you at this point in time? Well, I think that um, I, I loved reading it, and Sam was a friend and had actually been a friend of Dr. Brzezinski's when we were at the NSC. Um, and I highly respect uh, what he wrote and the new wave of things. I think that it's a little bit different now. I think, as I mentioned in my remarks, it's between the civilized world and the uncivilized. 
there are an awful lot of attempts at dialogues now, dialogues of civilizations, um, that allows a sharing of different views. And what was interesting is where, how that dialogue begins. So for instance, in 1998, uh, when we were in office, was when Khatami had been elected as president of Iran, and he wanted to come to the UN and have a dialogue of civilizations. And there are a variety of ways that those kinds of dialogues are brought forward. So there's a difference between clash and dialogue. And I think uh, while we may be talking about the differences, just the title uh, makes it a better kind of um, path to sure. deal with it in terms of looking at how we can see what we have in common against those who are uncivilized. And for me, I've had a very hard time with the vocabulary of all of this. And I have not liked the, word, the words war on terror because it makes those that are fighting us warriors when they're actually just murderers. And they get a greater kind of uh, um, reverence in their societies if we make warriors out of them. They are murderers, plain and simple. Thank you. Yeah. Um, maybe you could share with, with our audience a, a new project that you're working on with the Atlantic Council. And if you could, how is religion factoring into the thinking that you're engaged in as you try to yeah. work through this new project? Can I, before I do that, I see David Saperstein here. And one of the fun things that happened when I was writing the book was to have dinner at my house. We had David Saperstein. Imam Faisal, and Richard Land. And it was a very interesting dinner in terms of what religions had in common and what they didn't. And David is carrying on all this work. That's yeah, really great. David? Yeah. 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 Just, David walked across this stage on Tuesday afternoon receiving a Vicente well, Medal. So yeah. he's, uh, yeah. this is a big week. Um, so, this is about your new project with the Atlanta Well, let me Council. tell you this. What is interesting is I think that um, there is no question that what is happening in the Middle East and now across North Africa and even into Sub-Saharan Africa of trying to sort out what role um, a perversion of religion is taking um, and what it is doing to make life more complicated. What has happened is the Atlantic Council has asked Steve Hadley, um, who was the National Security Advisor for President Bush and me, to um, co-chair a task force in which we're taking a deeper look at the Middle East. Uh, there have been an awful lot of fire drills and band-aids and kind of a thought that we would take a deeper look. And we are looking at, um, we have commissioned some papers and we've done some things on security, on refugees, on education, uh, the economy, uh, and religion, and trying to sort out what would make sense in a longer way of dealing with what we're saying now is not a, just a crisis in the region, but a crisis from the region. One of the issues that is very, um, I think, germane to having a center that's in the West and how we operate is, I worked for a president who read a lot, and he would assign us books. So one he assigned to me was a book called The Peace to End All Peace, uh, by David Fromkin, which talks about the history of the modern Middle East. Uh, and the short version of the book is that the modern Middle East was created by the British and French bureaucracies lying to each other. And so there, a number of countries were put together or people installed. And what we're seeing now are some of the results of that. And trying to figure out, and this is what we're trying to, to work on, is how much do we um, try to support some of the shoots that are happening in the region and then working with them to support from the outside. Uh, but it leads, I think, very much to um, the mandate for the Berkeley Center, which is what can we do to understand better uh, what is going on and try to figure out how to, to see what the civilizations have in common. But it's tough. And, and part of it is, is understanding the vocabulary. So we talk about, um, modern, you know, for instance, fundamentalists or moderate Muslims. So then I thought to myself, moderate Muslims believe in moderation passionately. So maybe that's not the right adjective. So the question is, how do we identify things? Uh, what is a jihad? Um, and I think we need to work on the vocabulary a little bit more and understand what we're saying and how it's heard. And is there a surge or is it a revival or is it 
ijtihad, which is the way that um, there are discussions within the Muslim religion about how to, to revive things or move things forward. And, and I do think, again, that vocabulary is very important. Great. I'm going to open this up to our audience, but let me ask you one last question before, before folks start lining up. Um, in, in your remarks, you, you identified the limits of a government and being able to advance n knowledge about the role that religion might play in international relations and the role that universities might play. As we think about a next decade for the Berkeley Center, areas of focus, areas of emphasis that you think we should be taking on? Well, I, I do think that it's very important somehow to blend what is religion and what is culture. So for instance, and, and both have an influence in countries of, um, there is nothing in the Quran that basically talks about veiled women or not driving. Uh, a lot of that is cultural. So how much it comes from the countries, how much is partially the interpretation of what the Quran is. And just as I believed, and I continue to believe, that our diplomats need to understand the role of religion where they are without having to believe it, but to understand it, um, I think it's important for religious scholars and universities to also understand the context that, that uh, we are all operating in. And, and I think also, which is kind of peculiar to say, but I think we have to understand better uh, the role of technology in all of this. Um, and, and, you know, because as I said, everything spreads very rapidly. It is true that Desh knows how to use it better than we do. Uh, we need to sort out a lot of the how to modern, again, I, it's hard to figure out what the right word is, but, but basically uh, what the effect of the spread of information as quickly as it does, um, and, and fit it into the political, there, there's a nexus between politics and religion. There's no question, and all one has to do is look at the various countries to realize that that's true. Thank you, thank you. So we're gonna open this up. Um, please uh, come to the microphone, introduce yourself, and please, questions, questions, questions. <laughs> okay. My name is Samuel Shropshire. I'm married to a Czechoslovak. My wife is Slovak. She's Baptist. My daughter's Catholic, and I'm Muslim. So Works for me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I came here to Washington on this occasion to assist a Presbyterian minister whose home, or whose church's property is Christian Center, is currently occupied by illegal Jewish settlers just outside Bethlehem and by Israeli troops. What can we do to encourage Israel to negotiate peace with Palestine? Thank you. So if I were to ask you whether you'd like to go to Camp David, <laughs> you would probably say yes. I can tell you after two weeks in the rain with the Israelis and Palestinians, I don't care if I ever go back. Uh, and part of the arguments were over um, the disposition of how uh, Jerusalem was divided. Uh, if you think of Jerusalem as kind of four concentric circles in terms of the outer circle coming up with the 67 war, then the suburbs, then the inner city, and then the holy places. Uh, uh, Ehud Barak had made some very generous offers about the three outer circles. The question was about the holy places. And I think here is something that we began to talk about who owned them, God. And the question is how one introduces the best parts in terms of our religions to deal with the common issues that are there. But I think we do need to keep working on it. And for those people, all of us that have been there, we know that everybody needs to uh, have a sense that this is our responsibility in the various religions that we are a part of to try to press for some settlement on that. Thank you very much. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Secretary Albright. My name is Samantha Reed. I'm a graduate student in the English department here. I have two questions. One should hopefully be much shorter answer than the other. My first question is when you said you're, you found out you were Jewish, I was curious if you meant just ethnically, have you become religiously Jewish, or? No, I mean, I have to say, uh, I have learned an awful lot more about the religion. My, uh, as I said, one of my daughters married to a Jew. I've been to the bar and bat mitzvahs of my grandchildren. Uh, but I really was raised a Christian, and so 
Uh, I am uh, an Episcopalian, and, and I go to church, and I, am tr and I have learned the following thing. I don't like the word tolerance, because that means put up with. I need to know about, enough about my religion and enough about the others to respect them, and that is where I am. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my second question is kind of for both of you. It's a little bit closer to home than what your talk was mostly about, but it does concern the intersection of religion, politics, and this institution. So something I've been struggling with here um, is how can an institution accept federal funding yet fail to adequately assist young pregnant female students with pursuing and fully supporting every choice legally available to them? Which I understand that they're informed about all legal options, but they are not supported. And as a Jewish person who was Sorry. raised very liberally, this is something very confusing to me, and I'd love to hear both your perspectives That's on this. To you. I think I'll take that one. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, for, we, we live in a nation that has allowed for institutions with religious um, uh, histories and traditions to um, coexist with the rule of law in our nation. <coughs> and here, uh, as the nation's oldest Catholic university, there are some limitations to what we permit here on this campus. And we try to be very clear about that. Um, at every step of the way, so that when people are joining our community, they understand some of the limits and some of the constraints that they would experience here. Right, it's Thank more the, the federal funding that confuses me. Um, well, the federal funding we receive really is in two forms. So, uh, uh, sponsored research in our medical center and in our science departments, and in subsidizing some of our financial aid. So Thank in, you those, for in those two ways, yeah. um, we receive federal support. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Secretary. Sure. Next, please. Hi, my name is Claudia Phelps, and I'm with the Liberal Studies Program. And I want to know the message that your pin is telling us today. <laughs> I went to the exhibit of all your pins. OK, so, so these are very hard decisions. May I tell how this all started? Please. I clearly like jewelry. So um, <laughs> when I went to the United Nations in 93, the first Gulf War ceasefire had been translated into a series of sanctions resolutions. And I was an instructed ambassador, and my instructions were to make sure that the sanctions stayed on. So every day, I said something terrible about Saddam Hussein, which he deserved. He had invaded Kuwait. And so soon, a poem appeared in the papers in Baghdad comparing me to many things, but among them, an unparalleled serpent. And I had a snake pin, so I decided to wear it whenever we talked about Iraq. Um, and I think you've all seen how the ambassadors go out after a session in the press. So all of a sudden, the camera zeroes in. The reporter says, why are you wearing that snake pin? And I said, because Saddam Hussein compared me to an unparalleled serpent. And then I thought, well, this is fun. So I uh, went out, and I bought a lot of costume jewelry to depict what I thought we were going to do on any given day. So on good days, I wore flowers and butterflies and balloons. And on bad days, a lot of carnivorous animals and spiders and things <laughs> like that. Uh, and the other ambassadors began to um, get the picture here. And uh, if you remember, the first President Bush had said, read my lips, no new taxes. So I would just say, read my pins. And that is how it started. So today was a very hard decision, because we had a meeting of this Middle East group. And I have a pin that was given to me in Beirut, which is my name in Arabic. So I was going to wear that this morning. Then I thought, I probably shouldn't do that, because it wouldn't quite work in this uh, multicultural, multi religious So I decided to wear an owl for wisdom. That is my pin for today. We need wisdom. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, I always hope that what it really does say is my name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Hi, my name is Heather Spence. I am a scientist and an educator. And I'm curious to hear what aspects of religions do you think should or should not be taught to children, and which of those uh, should be in school or outside of school? I have no idea how to answer that. <laughs> uh, I, I do think that 
children uh, need to believe in something. I feel that very strongly. And as things get more and more complicated, that um, uh, for me, anyway, I do believe that they need to uh, be taught about a higher being and creation as something that we all need to preserve uh, because of what it means to each of us individually. I also do think that what needs to be taught, because as I talked about this, is the dignity of the individual and whatever does happen in terms of uh, respecting the, the children, the other children in the school. Uh, and more and more where everybody looks a little bit different is trying to figure out what we have in common. But I think it's a very hard question. Uh, but I do think, I personally do believe that children need to be, believe in a, in a higher being. I do believe that. But I think it's a really important question to think about in many ways. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Please. Hi, my name's Will Hallisey. I'm a senior studying government and economics. And uh, so you discussed a little bit um, uh, the nature of, well, all of it was a lot, a lot of discussion about the connection of religion and um, really how, how things need to reconcile to move forward. And so I think it's interesting because my grandfather was Jewish and my grandmother was Catholic and there was a big focus on critical thinking and, um, you know, kind of along this line of critical thinking in terms of religion and, you know, just um, processing in general. Uh, I, I recently read uh, the UVA transcripts of uh, Sandy Berger talking about his time in the Clinton White House. And uh, one, one thing that he discusses a lot of was um, how you and him and some other members of the White House really were you know, kind of a small group of intensely critical thinkers that really worked together to you know, move forward. So along this line of you know, the Middle East and thinking strategically and intelligently, um, in the modern world, and especially in this presidential election, we've certainly lost a lot of the intelligent discourse. Um, I mean, how, how, do you think, how do you think we recover that? How do you think we bring back that you know, importance of thinking? Well, I can tell you who to vote for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but, but let me say, I, I do think it's very important to somehow um, get back to some kind of civilized way of discussing what are the most complex issues ever. And one of the things that does happen is that in campaigns, often many things are said that then have to, when you finally take over the government, that you kind of have to figure out who hurt us. This is the, the hard, really hard part. You're in government, uh, in the government department. I think that one of the things that we seem to forget, and I travel abroad a lot, is that um, this is not just some uh, family discussion that's going on. And therefore, then you have to figure out how you explain what happened, why people said what they did, and try to walk a lot of things back. Um, I also do think that what is essential in the government, and I have to say, Sandy was a terrific national security advisor, because the thing that happens in, a, in, you know, you've now seen pictures of the Situation Room, et cetera, the, the various things that the principles, in order to have this work, the President of the United States has to have uh, a diversity of opinions delivered to him or her so that there is a chance to assess the things based on a very uh, careful thinking of which department thinks what. So a good national security advisor has to break the eggs, make sure that the departments get to say what they think, try to make an omelet out of them to give to the president. If we couldn't ever agree, we'd give the egg mess to the president. And then, but listening to diverse views was the various parts. And by the way, just for a little advertising, my class this weekend, we are doing a game simulation uh, in which we are dealing exactly with the kinds of issues um, in terms of what's going on. So on Friday and on Saturday and Sunday. For those who don't know the nature of this class, just describe a little bit. Yeah, so what I say, I, I say foreign policy is just trying to get some country to do what you want. Uh, so what are the tools? So my class is called the National Security Toolbox. And we go through the various tools. We finish that diplomacy, bilateral, multilateral, the economic tools 
threat of the use of force, the use of force. And then we have a game simulation. And um, uh, um, we have one room of American principles and another one, always an international one. Uh, the scenario this year is that the Russians are mucking around in Estonia. Uh, and um, uh, then we try to make decisions. And then I am the deus ex machina. And every time they get even vaguely close, uh, I screw it up. Uh, but if I could tell one story about what happened, I, I live two blocks, three blocks away, and I'm on the Georgetown uh, admissions tour. So in, people go by and they say, well, this is where the former Secretary of State lives. Uh, she is back teaching at Georgetown. Uh, and she's very popular, she's very approachable, and I feel like going out and waving. But like <laughs> five years ago, I have to schedule this thing in the spring after we've gone through everything. And I wasn't paying attention to the Hoyas. And we had, a, we had the game on the weekend of the Final Four. So the next week, the admissions tour comes by and says, this is where the former Secretary of State lives. She um, teaches at Georgetown again. She used to be very popular. <laughs> <laughs> So I always have to pay attention what spring weekend we do this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. We've got time for just a couple more. Um, my name is Alexander Kiley. I'm a student in the School of Foreign Service studying the intersectionality of philosophy and international politics. So my question is for the both of you. Um, Madam Secretary, in your lecture, you spoke about the need to build bridges across religious dialogues. And so my question is, how can we seek to build bridges across the differing ideologies behind these religions and even within these religions? Um, you said yourself, it, with the particular case of ISIS, we have Muslims fighting Muslims, Muslims murdering Muslims. And um, this can be seen as based on a differing uh, philosophical ideology of what is important within these religions and an important part of Diploma, uh, diplomacy is understanding these differing ideologies. So how can we seek to build bridges across not only these religions, but across the differing ideologies behind these religions? Well, I think the question is how to recognize the fact that there are different ideologies, understand enough about the different ideologies, and then try to figure out um, what they are telling us and how much of it is um, based on experience. I think we have to put it within its context. That's the issue. You don't have to believe it, but I think that one has to understand what motivates other people's beliefs. I see Sean Casey here, who at the State Department is doing where our diplomats are beginning to learn exactly how to look at the different ideologies and not necessarily, definitely not be um, advocates of them, but at least to understand what is going on. And what, for me, is generally about college, is learning the differences among things and understanding why they are different, and then trying to figure out whether there is something to be done about them. But the initial aspect of it is knowing what this is about. And part of the other part on ISIS, which isn't just ideologies, what we're talking about in this group that, we were, that I was telling you about is trying to figure out the sources of the conduct, why are people behaving the way they are? What is it? Uh, is some of it religion or not? Is some of it conditions, uh, uh, trying try to figure out what makes uh, people follow such a, uh, a killing kind of a, uh, an ideology. And so I do think they need to be studied and trying to, without just dismissing everything. That's what we're here for, is to study uh, what creates these issues, and then push back against them where it's possible. There, Sean? Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Hali Jilani. I'm a cross-border Pashtun from a very contentious border region that I'm sure you must have worked upon. And one of my first lessons in foreign policy was when my dad handed me a book written by a certain Joseph Corbell on Kashmir when I was 10 years old. I didn't know who you were, madam, yeah. but once I knew his daughter was the Secretary of State in America, it, it was a good day for me studying yeah. in Europe by okay. then. My biggest problem has been in the last few years, 
I have been a senior advisor and tactical instructor to the US Marine Corps in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, where I've actually spent the last 15 years living in tents and mud huts and you know, literally in, on the front lines in Fallujah and Helmand and places like that. Then we come home to places like Washington DC, which now is my home. And the worst thing is finding somebody to share those observations, those experiences, and those ex that extremely important knowledge with building those bridges. Most frustrating for me has been that the tribal elders and the, the community leaders that we did make inroads with, particularly myself, because I used to live in their houses in the community, I have to turn around and tell them that, look, I'm really sorry. I really cannot crack the code of bureaucracy in a place like DC. I don't know how to reach people so that they can hear a voice from the field. How does one do that here? Thank you. Um, my class last Monday mm -hmm. was about the whole, how humanitarian intervention works mm -hmm. um, as a, uh, having put all the tools together in the class now. And one of the issues for us was we, know how to do the initial, whether it's a military intervention in some form, uh, in partnership with others, and try to stop the killing. What we haven't figured out is exactly the part you're talking about next, mm -hmm. which is how you put the societies back together and how you put the things you've learned into place. I have said this, Americans are the most generous people in the world with the shortest attention span. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is somehow figure out how to absorb what you're saying. And I think that um, there are people within the government that would like to hear it. I actually think it's a pretty good thing for the Berkeley Center actually to do is to become a repository of some of this information. It also would help if and when, when Americans or various other people go back that they understand what they're dealing with, how complicated it is. So, uh, but it is hard to cat crack the bureaucracy, even if you're sitting on top of it. So um, the bottom line is there needs to be some way to absorb the information that you have. And by the way, I did help my father do the second edition of Danger in Kashmir. Really? Yeah. Oh, how wonderful. Well, thank you. <laughs> you brought back happy the, memories. Yeah. <laughs> just, just for those who don't know the history, say a word Can about your dad. Okay, so let me tell the story. My father was a Czechoslovak diplomat. And his last assignment was to go to a new conflict uh, uh, between India and Pakistan over Kashmir, representing Czechoslovakia on the United Nations um, there. So he finished what he was doing. He came to the United States. The communists had taken over. And he defected, asked for political asylum. So at that stage, the Rockefeller Foundation was finding jobs for Central European intellectuals or whatever. And they found him a job at the University of Denver. We had no idea where Denver was. My parents bought a car. We started driving across America. My mother said, they say Denver's the mile high city, but we're not going up, so maybe we're going the wrong direction. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> my father began to teach at the University of Denver. Ultimately, he became dean of the Graduate School of International Studies. And now the school is named in his honor, the Corbell School. But he died in 1977. And there were lots, he was a pretty big deal in Denver by then, and there were lots of flowers and tributes and things. And among them was a ceramic pot in the shape of a piano with leaves in it. And I said to my mother, where did this come from? And she said, it's from your father's favorite student, Condoleezza Rice. And what happened was that she was a music major, hence the piano. Her parents were associated with the University of Denver. She took an IR course from my father. He persuaded her to become an international relations major. She got her master's at Notre Dame and was working on her PhD with my father when he died. So this African-American music major from Alabama wrote her dissertation on the Czechoslovak military. In 1987, when I was helping Michael Dukakis in his presidential campaign, my job was to get um, senior advisors from the outside. So I didn't know Condi, but I thought, Soviet expert woman teaches on the West Coast called her up to see if she wanted to be one of the group. And she said, Madeline, I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm a Republican. And <laughs> I said, Condi, how could you be? We had the same father. 
I, thank you. We've got time for one more question. I'm so sorry, everybody, but please. Uh, Madam Secretary, my name is Moaz Hyatt, and I'm a, a freshman in the SFS. Uh, my question is, you mentioned the role of religion and also we need to re-examine its role in other fields. Do you think we need to re-examine the role of Islam in politics, in particular in the Middle East? Do you think the State Department needs to re-examine its role? And specifically, do you think Muslim Americans have a role to play in helping institutions like the State Department, like the White House, uh, find better solutions to these issues that we're facing? Well, first of all, I think we do need to continue to study Islam, which is why, or, or all religions. I mean, frankly, the first question uh, about what was going on in Israel, I think we need to understand that. Uh, we need to understand what is happening in a variety of places uh, in terms of religion. By the way, if I could just raise this, President Putin seems to believe that um, he is uh, uh, in charge of the Orthodox Church there. So um, there are real questions about the, the sense that um, you know, how, how does religion affect the behavior everywhere? And partially what was going on in the Balkans, again, was an extrapolation of where people used religion in other ways. So we, this is the purpose. And frankly, when I wrote the book that I wrote, the purpose of it was um, not to, to become somebody that fully understood every aspect of religion, but that wanted diplomats to understand that religion plays a role in politics and needs to be studied. And so that is happening, as I said. Um, both Sean Casey and, and uh, Rabbi Saperstein are doing those kinds of things, and the Foreign Service Institute now does, in fact, have people study it. So I think that is worthwhile. I also do think that the American Muslim community um, needs one to be understood and respected, but also play a role exactly in this. Because ultimately, a bunch of us Christians and Jews cannot tell the Muslims uh, how to evolve or, or to, to go through a thought process uh, on religion. And I think that we need to see ourselves as allies of those who see the goodness and mutuality of religion against those who are using it to murder people. And that, and it's a good way to end, I think, this is there is a difference between those who believe and then those who just murder people. And we have to remember that those horrible things are being done by murderers and not by warriors or believing people that think that God is our way of being united and not divided. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't think of a more appropriate way for us to launch this celebration of 10 years of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown. Again, our gratitude to Bill and Marge Berkeley for their presence here today, and to Secretary Albright for sharing this moment with us. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all. Yeah.